Good evening, praise the Lord. How are you tonight? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, before we begin tonight, I want to let you know um, that we've put out an English CD with my son, Luke, he sings, and uh, my niece, Tanya, and her brother, Saneli Popovich, Rosita, uh, my sister's children. And then they let me sing two songs on my own album. That's a really good pleasure. So this is in English. It's called, I Will Follow. Мы тихо что закончили 27-й альбом, 50 років, что співаем с Павлом Ходьевичем. 50th anniversary, the last CD we'll record. No more CDs. My voice is gone. Pastor Serge asked me to sing. I said, I can't because I have issues. I, I wish, I wish. If, if, if you hear me sing now, you won't buy any CDs. I guarantee Guarantee. Thank you. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously. It's not I don't want to. I can't. And so this is the last thing we did, and we just barely met. On the back cover, you'll see me at a 16. We started 50 years ago in 1970 to 2020. And so this is in the back. And then I wrote the book called In My Father's House. So this is a great book. If you're growing up in your dad's house, you're a boy or a girl. If you're a father, if you're a wife, buy it for your husband. I wrote it for men, but everybody's buying it. Everybody's reading it. I'll tell you one story. Uh, there's very serious topics in there. How to bless your children, how to discipline your children, how to protect your children, how to ask forgiveness, how to teach them to ask forgiveness. Great lessons. But I'm going to tell you one funny story when I was 16. So when I was 16... Uh, my dad raised me with grace. He was a very, very godly preacher and pastor. But he raised me with trust. I think that when you raise somebody with law and just tell them all the things they can't do, it's very difficult to live under law. But when you, you teach your child to live under trust, then they do more than the law because they don't want to hurt your feelings or God's heart. That's how my dad raised me. And I never went into the world because of it. So my dad's heart, he trusted me. For example, one night, it was a Saturday night, uh, we were at a wedding. And the wedding was so late, and then I didn't have a car, and I was waiting for two guys to take me home, brothers. And they were late. So I got home super late in the morning, and I come to my front door of my house, Right? I, where I lived with my mom and my dad. I was 16, 17. And the house is dark. I said, oh no, everybody's sleeping. And I didn't have a key. And my mom, like all Slavic moms, she locked the front door, right? <laughs> they put a lock on the top, a lock in the thing, and they put a chair under the door. Yeah. <laughs> and so I figured if I ring the bell, I'm going to wake everybody up. So you know what I did? I went into the backyard. And so then I climbed up to the first floor window and I popped the window open and I'm opening the window and I figure if I go in quietly, I won't wake anybody. So I pop up to the window, I'm going inside, I'm halfway in and I look to my bed and there's an old guy sleeping in my bed. Oh no, some visiting pastor because my dad was the pastor of the church. And whose house did they sleep in? My dad's house, right? I'm half in, half out. What do I do? If I go out, I still have to go to the front door, ring the bell, wake everybody up. So I figure if I'm quiet enough, I'll get inside and go to the front room and lay on the couch. And everything will be good. So I'm crawl, wriggling in little bit more and the guy wakes up you can imagine you're sleeping in somebody's house right and there's a guy crawling in the window and he says in his broken english who are you what do you want and i said no no it's okay i'm pastor david Duke's son this is my room i didn't know you would be sleeping in my bed Oh, oh, oh. 
he calmed himself down i climbed into the room and then the guy says don't worry i know tell father <laughs> i just shook my head and went to the couch you know the greatest part of the story is i told my dad the next morning everything that happened my dad was laughing so hard because he trusted me he knew that i wouldn't be in a bad place i wasn't doing any bad things it's not my fault i came home late <laughs> and he didn't tell me there's a guy sleeping in my bed in this book how you could use discipline so that there is uh all kinds of discipline there's physical discipline and then there's abstract discipline where there's consequences for your children do wrong i'm not going to take the time because i have a great lesson for us tonight but in here how one time i washed my son's out mouth out with soap that's luke because he was talking back and so i washed his mouth out with soap and he's blowing bubbles <laughs> and another story is how my older son he stole a ball from toys r us and i didn't spank him I took him back to Toys R Us to ask forgiveness of the store manager. And man, he never stole anything ever again, <laughs> to my knowledge. <laughs> By the way, you can buy the book on CD, or excuse me, uh, flash key. Uh, and uh, the book is 15. This is 20 because it took so long to do. You had to pay a guy to read a professional uh, dictor, lector, right? And if you want to learn how to preach, we have another CD. This has seven lessons in Russian, separately. Seven lessons in English, how to put sermons together, okay? How to be organized in your presentation. And this is seven video lessons, half an hour each, and the seventh one is one hour. I'm sorry, I took this time to do commercials, but anyway. All right, so... I want to speak to you on a subject. A young lady came to me this afternoon and she said, you know, how do you hear the voice of the Lord? And then as I thought about that, I said, you know, that'll be a good lesson for tonight. And I want to share with you. It's a long lesson, but I hope it will be interesting for you. God speaks in different ways. When you hear the lesson, you'll hear all the ways that God can speak and he does speak. Some people think that God is somewhere in heaven and he lets us do and lets us live and he just watches us and we make our choices and we do our decisions and God is silent, but God is not silent. If we have a heart that asks him, if we have a heart that listens to him, he will speak. Not when we want, not how we want, but God will speak. In fact, next slide God desires to have intimacy with us what is intimacy to be intimate with someone uh, like a friend okay not in marriage but in a friend as a friend you share your, your your deepest secrets you can you could open your heart to that person if you trust them and they trust you that's called friendship deep friendship I love this verse in Exodus chapter 33 verse 9 when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud, the presence of God, would stand at the door of the tent. And listen to this. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Do you know that's such a powerful thing? That God would want to show friendship with man? But it only happens, not with special people, but with people who will take the time and the preparation to prepare their hearts that God can speak to them. Next slide. Now, what is the reality? That God is a personal God. Of all the religions on the earth, the Islam or the Muslim religion, Krishna, uh, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, all of the many isms of the world, either God is big or God is uh, intimate, but he's not both. We have the only God who is both big and will speak to our hearts. Islam, their God, Allah, that they call, that's not God Jehovah, that's, that's a moon God. It might be even a demon. 
They say their God is big, but they can't know if they're saved. They can only be saved if they die in a holy war. So they don't even know if they're going to go to paradise. That's Islam. Now, uh, in, in the land of India, right, Hindus, they have a thousand and more gods. And they're really small. The monkey god, the elephant god, the snake god. And they have these statues, right, that demons can actually possess and can control a person through this contact. That's why the Bible says not to have idolatrous, idolatrous statues. Their God is small. They could put him in their pocket. But he's not big. We have the only God who is infinitely big. But he's very much personal. And Jesus, I believe he's referring to Psalm 23. Do you remember Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, right? My shepherd, he leads me, makes me lie down, he feeds me, I will live in his house forever. Well, Jesus goes further, and in John chapter 10 and verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. And listen to this, I know my own, that's my own people, and my own people know me. Verse 27, again, if the Lord is our shepherd, we're his sheep, right? Right? And Jesus says, my sheep, what? Hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Do you know how to hear the voice of God is to follow God, is to give your heart to God and Jesus. And what happens is he becomes your shepherd. You join his gathering called the flock of sheep. And he'll lead you. He'll feed you. Psalm 23 becomes a reality when Jesus is our shepherd and our savior. Amen? Next slide. So there's two reasons why God speaks. One is communication and the other is communion. Communication is that God wants to tell you something. Oh, God doesn't speak to me. One of the main reasons God doesn't speak to you or to someone, you're not listening. Or you already made your mind up. One guy was praying for a wife. He said, Lord, let your will be done, but give me Marusha. So no matter what God would say, he already made his choice. And God says, okay. And then he marries Marusha. It's not, the, not, a, good, not a good thing. <laughs> or maybe it is. But God wants to communicate. Now, when we talk with God and he talks to us, he gives us answers. David, was David a champion? Yes? Was he a warrior? Was he a soldier? Yes? But whenever he was in trouble, you know what he did? David asked the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. Lord, I'm in the city so and so. Will they give me up to my enemy? God said, yes. And so God, God warned him. Psalm 103, verse 7, it says, he made, his no, he made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. Here is the difference what God did with the man of God and what God with the people of God. To the man of God who took time to hear him and listen to him, he, he told him why. But to the people, he only said, what? For example, God leads him into the desert. There's no food. God sends manna. Leads him into the desert. There's no water. God brings water out of the rock. So God had a purpose to put us in difficult places so God can answer those trials, right? So God would explain to Moses but the people didn't know the why. Why has God led us into the wilderness? There's no food. In Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of Moses, chapter 8, God says, do you want to know why I tested you? I wanted to see what's in your heart. Would you respond with trust and faith? Or would you complain? Would you follow me not understanding? Or do I have to tell you everything so you would do it. And you see, he said, I let you hunger so I could feed you. 
I let you thirst so I could bring you water out of the rock. So the why is explained to Moses, but the people of God just saw the what. You know, when you hear God's voice, you learn a lot more than just what is happening. And the one, the one question that many Christian people say, why did God allow this? Why is there problems? Why did my child do this? Why, 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 why? And you know, there's an answer to that. But we don't want to know the answer. We just want to complain. So communication where God will explain the why. And the second reason for hearing the voice of God is just to be with him. Like in our language in English state, to hang out. Who do you hang out with? You hang out with people you enjoy being with. You are with someone that you enjoy talking to them and they talk to you. Do you know that's the highest purpose of hearing God's voice? For example, we pray. So this is how a lot of people pray. Lord, I need this. Lord, bless me here. Lord, give me this. Lord, tell me what to do. Lord, 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 I need, I need, I want, I ask, I ask. Thank you. Amen. And we go. <laughs> how many Psalms did David write? He says, I wait upon the Lord. I wait upon the Lord more than the servant who waits on his master. Wow. A servant doesn't tell the master what to do. The servant says to the master, Master, I am under your command. What do you say is my next task, my next, my next job? And the Lord speaks to the servant. Do you know? When a little boy heard the voice of God and didn't know it was the voice of God, he ran to the priest and the priest told him, next time God says something, say these words, speak, Lord, for your servant. What? Is listening. Number one, we have to understand we're not the boss. God is the boss. Amen. And number two, God, do you want to say something to me? Give God the opportunity to speak to you. One of the reasons we don't like to do that is that we're afraid of what God's going to tell us. So we want to continue to live our life, our way, but we still want to hear from God to see if God agrees with us. And I want to tell you right now, God doesn't agree with you. He wants you to agree with him. Amen. <laughs> And then you know you're in the will of God when you're willing to do the will of God. And that's why the Lord spoke to Moses face to a face. Because Moses learned what it meant to be a friend of God. You ever hear that? I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. That's based on what Jesus said to his disciples. You are no longer slaves. I call you my friends. But there's trust involved there. Now, the next part of the lesson, the conditions. So there are seven conditions that if we do all seven of these things or try to, we prepare our hearts to hear God's voice better. Number one is what we said already. Jesus is the Lord of our lives. To hear his will, you must be be willing to do it. So many uh, times people say, Lord, 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 no. Do you know the word Lord, no, is a contradiction? <laughs> if he's Lord, you can't say no to God, right? But if he's not Lord and you're Lord or I'm Lord, then we say no. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so who's Lord, you or the Lord God? And Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. What is a kingdom? A kingdom is where somebody is king. Now, who is it? You or God? <laughs> Me or God? It's God. When we are in the kingdom of God, Jesus is the king. Hallelujah. And we have to do his will. That's the number one requirement to hear the voice of God. You must be willing to do it. Number two, you have to have a clean heart. 
David said, if I hide, another word is cherish, if I hide sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Do you know to do God's will, you must give up your will, number one, and number two, you have to say, Lord, is there some sin in my heart that I, you, I haven't repented of? Cleanse my heart. And do you know, sin will block our ears to hear. So I believe it's Isaiah 59. And he says through the prophet Isaiah, Behold, the hand of the Lord is not too short that it cannot save. Neither is his ear too dull that it cannot hear, but your sins have made a separation between you and your God, right? So sin will block you to hear God's voice. Repent. Say, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. Number three is simple, but sometimes it's hard. When you approach the Lord to hear his voice, you have to be willing to do it, we said. You have to get rid of sin, we said. But number three, number three, you have to believe that he will speak to you. You know, the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So this is what we do. When we say, Lord, your will be done. When we say, Lord, cleanse my heart. Give God an opportunity if he chooses to, to say something. Well, then the question is, how do I know it's the voice of God and not the voice of the devil and not the voice of my imagination? Yes, there are three voices in your head. <laughs> it could be the voice of God. It could be the voice of the devil or a demon. And it could be your own thoughts. Well, how do I know God's voice? We'll get to that. Be patient. We'll get to that. That's a good, good question. I saw a guy with a t-shirt one time in the store, and the t-shirt said, do the voices in my head bother you? <laughs> Number four, worship. Worship is not praise. Worship comes from the heart. Worship is not being loud or singing loud or or, or yelling, or jumping up and down. That could be praise, and that has its place. I'm not against that. But worship is different. This is not a good example, but I'm going to give it anyway. Anybody have a dog in their house, right? A dog? Okay. You know when you come in the house, a dog is like, <laughs> so happy to see you. The tail is wagging. They're jumping up on you. They're happy. That's praise. But after he settles down, you sit in your chair, and the dog sits at your feet and puts his nose on his paws and is just looking at you. That's worship. <laughs> I didn't say it's a good example. But you see the difference? Sometimes we're like little chihuahua with God. Sometimes we have to be quiet before the Lord. You know, it's really interesting that when God said to Abraham to give up his son, his only son, that God gave him through a miracle, you know what Abraham said to the servant? He said, you stay here. The boy and I, we're going to climb the mountain and worship. Do you think Abraham was jumping up and down that day? Do you think he was saying, praise you, God, I'm going to kill my son. Oh, this is great. I don't think so. I think that he made a decision in his heart I don't understand, God, but I'm here. I don't know what's going to happen, God, but I obey. And that is true worship of God, where God has your heart. One thing have I desired of the Lord, said David, and that will I seek after. What, David? That I could live in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life. What are you going to do? Sleep on the church pew? No. His heart is in the house of the Lord. That I may behold the beauty of the Lord. Do you know the, the glory of God is so beautiful? Do you want to see his glory? I don't think we'll see it with our eyes. 
but we can sense it with our spirit. Do you know after we quiet down and after we're in a place of surrender and our hearts are clean and we're in the presence of God, God speaks. One time in worship, uh, I was in Sacramento. It was Father's Day. I just preached a sermon for men. The Spirit of God was all over me. After I did the last prayer, then the pastor came, and I went from here to the last chair on the first row by the wall. And I was just there worshiping. I said, thank you for giving a good message. And I'm just worshiping. And I see a picture. I see a vision. And I see myself in India, and my wife, Esty, she's with me, and she has the Indian clothes. And my daughter, Larissa, I have one daughter, she is with us, and she has Indian clothes. And it was just a brief picture in my mind, a vision. But I, why am I thinking about India? I just finished preaching to Russian guys in a Russian church, right? I wasn't thinking about India. But God spoke to me because it was a time of worship. It was a time where my heart was quiet. It was a time when the Spirit of God was moving. And 10 minutes later, I went and called my wife. I said, honey, in February, I go every year to a school in India. I want you to come with me, and I want Larissa to come with me. And they did, and we had a beautiful and blessed time. Number five. Sometimes, to hear the voice of God, listen to this. You have to silence the voice of the enemy. How do you do that? Well, if you are asking God for some, I'm going to give you examples, okay? This is what I do. I say, Lord, if there's any sin in my heart, cleanse me and show me. I'll repent. After that, I said, Lord, take my thoughts and cause my thoughts to be quiet. And thirdly, I ask the Lord, Lord, would you bind Satan so he doesn't deceive me and he doesn't speak to me? And you silence the voice of the devil. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee and run away from you. Do you know when you bind the enemy, he can't speak to you? Because <laughs> the word of God is true. And then if I hear a voice, I know it's God's voice. You know, number six, another condition to hear God's voice is when you fast. When you fast, it means you go without food. There's many kinds of fast. But let me talk about the most powerful one, where you only drink water. And you could fast one day. And you know a really neat way to fast, if you're not, you can't fast a long time, is you eat, you eat dinner uh, Tuesday night, say it's 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, you eat supper. Then the next morning you skip breakfast and you skip lunch and then you only eat until 5 or 6 the next day. You have fasted 24 hours. That was the Hebrew day. The Sabbath started Friday night and the Sabbath ended Saturday night when the sun went down. 24 hours, yes? So that's a really cool way to fast two meals, which is possible. And what happens when we fast? Well, listen to this. When we fast, we have no food in our stomach. I'll give you the opposite. Think of Thanksgiving. Do we have a lot of food on Thanksgiving Day? Yes, no. <laughs> we have so much food that after we eat all the food that is prepared, what do we want to do later on, hour later? What do we want to do? Exactly. The blood goes from our head and goes to our stomach to digest the food, right? So you're like sleepy, not thinking clearly. But when you fast, your stomach is empty. And the blood that normally would digest food now it goes to your brain. And when you read the word of God, the word of God speaks to you. When you pray, right, you're more alert spiritually. So fasting is a powerful way to help us 
hear the voice of God. Jesus never said, if you fast. He said, when you fast. So fasting was a normal part of Jewish life. Number seven, next slide. Excellent. Always ask for confirmation. If you hear something, you need proof. You need another confirmation of what you heard is from the Lord. Can I give you an example? So, do you remember where the Maidan in Ukraine happened and they shot 100 people? Now, I'm not going to talk about politics, right, wrong, whose side. No, no. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. So, I was exactly in February in India teaching once a year in that Bible school, right? And I hear the news that they shot 100 people for demonstrating right or wrong. Let's not get into that. But 100 people are dead. Oh, my goodness. I'm supposed to be there in May for a large youth conference. And nobody knows what's going to happen. Is it revolution? The president ran away. What's going on? We don't know. Now, I have to say to God, God, <laughs> go or no go? <laughs> Do I go to Ukraine? Do I not go to Ukraine? Pretty, pretty uh, desperate prayer, yes? So I told the class of students, pray for me. I need to hear from the Lord. That night, I got on my knees by my bed. I said, God, I'm going to ask you for three confirmations. No, Lord, four. I, you know, is it wrong to ask God for confirmation? No, Gideon asked for confirmation, right? Did you know that God gave him four? We know of two. But do you know, he didn't know if this visitor from God was really from God. He says, are you the Lord? Can I bring you food? And the Lord said, yeah, put it on the rock. And the Lord pointed to it and it burned up and he disappeared. And Gideon said, whoa, that was God. <laughs> the food's gone and he's gone. Whoa. First confirmation. And the Lord appears to him again and says, I want to use you to liberate my people. Well, he says, I have a sheep uh, skin with, with fleece, white fleece. Make it dry and the grass wet. Happened. The Lord says, so Gideon says, one more, one more. He says, make the fleece wet and the grass dry the next morning. The Lord did it. That's three. So Gideon has 33,000. Then it was 10,000. And then he's left with 300 men. And then Gideon's like, is this God's will? 300 men against 185,000 soldiers. God says, go down into the tent. Listen what they're saying. That's the fourth confirmation. And Gideon knew that they were afraid. And Gideon knew that God was sending him. And Gideon had a great victory. Hallelujah. Well, back to India. I knelt by my bed that night. I said, God, could you confirm if I'm supposed to go? Do you know the greatest confirmation is peace from God? Peace. If you don't have peace from God, it's not God's will. You want to know God's will? Number one confirmation is you have peace from God and you feel like it's okay, I could go. And so that was Tuesday. Friday is the last day of our teaching. I was there uh, five days teaching and then we're flying home Saturday night. And we went onto the roof of the building. This is India, it's February, it's 90 degrees outside. And then the director and his wife put me in a chair they said, students, let's pray for George. He needs to know, and uh, let's pray for him. If God gives you a word, you tell him. So they all laid hands on me, and they're praying, they're praying. And the school director's wife, she says, do you know, George, I have this word from God that I will send my angel ahead, ahead of you. He will break the bars of iron, and the gates will open, and you'll go through. And you know, God gave me that verse when we went to Chernobyl in 1986. Not Chernobyl, Kiev, after Chernobyl exploded, excuse me. And so I knew that verse. It's like, wow, she doesn't know that I know that verse. Wow, that's the second confirmation. And then another person says, I have a scripture verse, but I don't know what it says. I think it was Isaiah 
45, right? But Isaiah 45 is the verse that the lady said. She said it without the quote of the scripture reference. He gave the reference not knowing the verse. It was the same verse. <laughs> Isaiah 45. Well, three confirmations. But I asked for four. And the one girl says, you know, I heard the word open, open. God said he will open. I didn't know what God will open. But now I know it's the gates. He'll open the gates. Wow. Four. And I went in May. It was a powerful time. Hallelujah. 1,200 young people were gathered for a youth conference from four oblasts or province. And God, it was a time of confusion in Ukraine, but it was a time of the word of God. Amen. I come back from Ukraine, go home, spend a week with my wife, and I have to be in Jacksonville Bible School. So I came on Sunday morning to the church. I sat down in the first row. And Brother Pasha Stefoglu is going to translate me. I said, Pasha, how are you? He says, great, George. I said, why are you so happy today? He said, I got a verse from the Lord this morning. I said, oh, really? What verse is that? He said, Isaiah 45, where God said he's going to open the gates up. And I'm thinking that verse is for me. <laughs> Do you know God will confirm I love what Reagan said to Gorbachev. Doveriai, no što? Proveriai. Trust, but verify. In fact, the book of uh, the law says, let everything be established by two or three witnesses. We heard about that morning. Jesus said, are there any who accuse you? And there weren't any witnesses. There were no confirmations. They all left. So he let her go. And Paul says, let it be established. Number four, these are the methods. Now, there are ten. Ten? I'm going to go through them quickly. Are you ready? By the way, I will leave this message on your computer, the laptop from uh, New Chance Church. So if you want to download the PowerPoint, you can do that from the laptop that's going back to New Chance Church, okay? Okay. What are the ways that God will speak? What are the methods God will use to speak to us? Number one is when you actually hear the physical sound of the voice of the Lord. This is called an audible voice, a voice you can hear. It's very, very rare. I have never heard the physical voice in my ears. Some people have. Okay, little Samuel did, and others, I haven't. But I've heard another voice in my heart, in my mind. Jesus heard the voice of God and the people at the river. When he got baptized, the Father God in heaven couldn't contain himself. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Wow. It happened again when Peter, James, and John went with Jesus up a mountain. And then they were so tired, they fell asleep. And then when they woke up, Jesus was shining with the glory of God. Moses and Elijah were talking with him about his death in Jerusalem to come. And Peter just starts talking. God interrupts him. But he said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. The second way that you can hear the voice of God is through a picture. Do you know that when Peter was fasting one day, God showed him a vision of a sheet, a white sheet in the book of Acts. There were pigs, there were shrimp, there were lobster, all the food that Jews could not eat, non-kosher. And he hears the voice of God saying, Rise, Peter, and eat. And Peter said, no, a Jew cannot eat that forbidden food. Ha ha, I passed the test. God said, no, don't call unclean what I have made clean. What? God shows him the vision three times, and then he instructs him, go to such and such a house. There is a man who is praying. 
Wow. Sometimes God tells you to do something you don't want to do, but God confirms it many, many times. So Peter hears the voice of God through a picture that God showed him. Apostle Paul, he was taken up to the third heaven and he saw many things that God said to him. God revealed to him some of them he wrote down in his letters. Paul wrote 14 letters. He wrote more letters than Peter and James and John, the disciples of Jesus. They call Paul the 13th apostle. But John on the island of Patmos, he was exiled for his faith in Jesus Christ. And the Lord said, come up here and I will show you. And then John saw what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to take one minute to explain time. This is a little bit scientific, but I'm going to make it really, really simple. Okay, question. Have any of you ever seen a parade, a procession? When you stand on the sidewalk, you see the beginning of the parade, yes? As the parade, the people marching, the band playing, the horses riding, they pass in front of you, and finally, that long parade finishes, right? And it goes away further on to the next block. So you see the parade from the side, and you experience the beginning, the middle, and the end. But what if you were in a helicopter a thousand feet up and you see the entire parade? You see the beginning, you see the middle, and you see the end all at once. That's how God sees time. God is above time. Time is a scientific concept that Einstein said is the fourth dimension. We're not going to get into any of that. But God took John up to that view and God showed him what yet will happen. And John saw things he didn't understand. He said, I saw a torch. What's a torch? A torch is a long stick with fire on the end. Yes? And this torch was flying. What did John see? A missile or a rocket. Does John know what a rocket is? Flying in the air with fire coming out of one end? No. Look, it's a flying torch. <laughs> and in the book of Revelation, John writes these things that he sees and he doesn't know how to explain them. So it sounds a little bit symbolic or strange. But the point is this. The point is this. That God took Paul, God took John, and God showed Peter on the mountain in a vision. And he showed him things in the spirit world. And you know that's a very special, very special thing. When you are close to God and God wants to tell you something, he will show you something. All through the Bible, the prophets of God, they saw things that you could not see with your eyes. One time the prophet was blind and the king wanted an answer from the prophet. So he sends his wife and he says, put a disguise. Hide yourself that he won't know. And she knocked on the door of the prophet and the prophet says, come in, wife of the king. Why are you hiding? He's blind. He can't see. But in the spirit, God revealed it to him. Wow. Now the third way that God speaks is in a dream. Now let me qualify that. There are dreams from God and there are dreams from kolbasa or pepperoni pizza. Not every dream is from God. Some dreams are just because you're too active, says Ecclesiastes, and with much activity comes dreams. Dreams are that your mind is trying to get all the information that you accumulate in the day and some of it is, doesn't make any sense at all. I've had dreams. One time in Bible school, there was a girl that I liked. I was single. And God said, do not focus on any relationships. But you know, she was really cute. <laughs> so I sat by her. God said, what are you doing? Nothing. I'm not doing nothing. I'm opening the door for her, you know. 
God says, what are you doing? Just opening a door. You see, God sees your heart. And he knows why you're doing what you're doing. Not just what you're doing. And God says, she's not the one for you. But you know what? Are we stubborn sometimes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I didn't do anything wrong. But in my heart, I'm thinking, maybe she's the one. God says, no. <laughs> and we're not listening. One night during Bible school, God gives me a dream. And in my dream, this girl became my wife. Her name was Sandy. I won't tell you her last name. You don't need to know. She's not, she's not Slavic. She's American. You wouldn't know her anyway. <laughs> and now Sandy is my wife. And we're standing on the table. And all the students are down below. I don't know why we're standing on the table. I told you dreams are weird sometimes. <laughs> but she's my wife. And I said to the group of students, I want to introduce you to my wife, Sandy. And everybody said, oh. Like they're disappointed in my choice. And I'm like, whoa, why are they disappointed? And I looked at her and I said, oh. <laughs> and I woke up. <laughs> Let me tell you, that dream scared me. <laughs> and you know what? I, that morning, I said to God, was that dream from you? And I didn't have to ask because I knew it was. No answer. I said, God, give me a verse. Confirm it. No answer. And I'm trying to make God speak. No answer. So then I had a Bible reading program. So I would mark with a pencil, a colored pencil, a dot. So I'm reading through the Bible. And the last chapter I read, I would make a little circle in blue or green, depending what color I was going through the Bible in. Because blue was the first, green was the second time I read it, and on and on. So I was in Job chapter 33. That was the one that I was supposed to read for the next day. And you know what I read that morning after that dream? In verse 12 it says, For God speaks to men in dreams and visions in the night while they lie on their beds to warn them of danger, to keep them from falling into a pit. I'm thinking marrying the wrong person is really a pit you can't climb out of. And God revealed to me in a dream she was not the one for me. Nobody says amen. <laughs> I say amen. <laughs> Let me take you to another dream. Because you know what? Illustrations are really the life of a sermon. They're the windows. Now Bible school is finished. And I go to Canada. And I go to this camp. Just like this camp. I had a lake. It was called Moose Lake. <clears throat> and I saw another nice girl. She looked just like Sandy. Had blonde hair. Blue eyes. And now I'm a little smarter. I said, okay, Lord, I'm not saying anything. I'm not doing anything. Now I'm going to ask you first. And that night I went to bed. And I had a dream I'll never forget. In my dream, I'm on my knees talking to Jesus. But I don't see Jesus. I just see myself talking to him. And Jesus is off screen. And Jesus is saying to me these words. I'll never forget it. You will not get married now. I was 21 years old. But you will get married later. Do you know something? When God tells you something, he also gives you the understanding. And I knew and I saw my age, 21 to 29. And 25 is in the middle. And later is on the other side of 25. So I had the understanding that I would not get married at 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, or 25, it would be on the other side of 25. And in my dream, I said, yes, Lord. I broke. I started to pray in tongues. And I woke up, and I was praying in tongues out loud. 
I scared myself. <laughs> but you know what? That was the place that I would meet my future wife. And I married a girl when I was 27 and she was 22, short of a month. So for me, you know, a dream is very, very important. I could tell you more dreams, but let's move on. Number four, another way that God will speak, and this is very rare, he will send an angel. You know, when Peter was in jail, he fell asleep. Peter, how can you sleep in jail? You know how? In John chapter 20, Jesus said, when you were young, you go where you want. It's only when you get really old, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. So Peter said, ha ha. Jesus said, I would get arrested when I'm an old man. And he was still a young man. So he said, nope, I'm going to get delivered. And he's sleeping. And an angel comes and he has to hit him in the side to wake him up. And then the doors open up and Peter is delivered. I could tell you more stories. Let's move on. Number five, God could speak to you through a song. Has ever, God ever spoken to you through a song? You're in a worship service, you know, and you're singing to God, right? And all of a sudden, God speaks to you. You know why? Number one, because you're worshiping. Number two, because your heart is concentrated on him. Number three, that your heart is open. And so God can speak through a song. Number six, God can speak through the gifts of the Spirit. I went to Bible school with Youth with a Mission in Lausanne, Switzerland. And Lauren Cunningham was the director of this beautiful mission that is the biggest mission organization in the world. And it's a long story, but I went to Lausanne, Switzerland, and they had a woman come in who had one of the gifts of spirit. Some Russians would call it prophecy, but it was different than prophecy. She had what the Bible says is word of knowledge. In other words, God would reveal information about the person she's praying, and she would pray that information. She wasn't prophesying. She was saying what she saw in the Spirit. So we all that week prepared our hearts. We didn't want anything God to say anything bad about us. So we're repenting all week. Wednesday came, it was my turn. We had 50, uh, 50, 60 students at the time, I can't remember. And so I get on my knees, the director of school is there, and this woman, Jean Darnell, was there. She lays her hands on my head. She doesn't know me. She doesn't know I'm Ukrainian. She doesn't know that I've been in the Soviet Union two years now, 73, 74. This was 75. She says, this is not a call from God. This is a confirmation of your call. God called me in January. This was March. How did she know that? God showed her. And then she said these words. I see you as a bush of roses planted in a garden of simple flowers. You are not from there, but I have transplanted you there and everyone knows you're not from there, but it is right, and they will receive you. And then she says, and you will go back into the ground, into the roots from where your people have come from, where your fathers have come from. She stopped. She says, who are you? Who are you? What are your people? And the School director said he's Ukrainian and he just was in the Soviet Union twice already. God used him there in a group that they sing in. Meanwhile, I'm crying. The snot is flowing. I can't talk. And you know what? It was God's confirmation to me that I was to serve the Slavic people. I wasn't born there. I don't speak Ukrainian perfectly. There's mistakes. I don't speak Russian well at all. I can't preach in Russian. And yet here's this woman who doesn't know me. She confirms to me the call of God. 
God already gave me, and she is the confirmation. And I never forgot her, her word of knowledge. Now, let's talk about prophecy. Number seven. Prophecy should never be your main guidance. Uh-oh, uh-oh, George, now you're stepping on thin ice. Wait, wait, wait. Hear what I'm saying. Prophecy should not be your main guidance. I believe, according to the scriptural principles, that if God wants to guide you, he speaks to your heart first. And then he uses prophecy to confirm what he already told you. Because be careful of those people who say to you, God told me to tell you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Sometimes it's true, but sometimes it's not. Let me tell you the best example of when it's not God's way of speaking. In 1 Kings chapter 13, there is a king who's not obeying the Lord. The older prophets are also not obeying the Lord. So God raises up a young man, a young prophet, rise up, go to the king, bring the word of the Lord, judgment for what he's doing wrong, and then on your way home, don't stop anywhere, don't greet anybody. This is so serious. You go and you come and obey my voice. Yes, Lord. The young man does what God told him to do. He tells the king a prophecy the king doesn't want to hear. And then he leaves and on his way home, an old prophet stops him. Wait, 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 young man, young man. Come to my house. The young man gives the answer. No, no, I cannot. God instructed me not to stop and eat anywhere. I must continue on my way. And the old prophet lied. And he said to the young man, I too am a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord told me to tell you, you are to come to my house to eat. And because the young boy was inexperienced and because he listened to the old man, he went. They sit down at the table to eat and the spirit of the Lord comes on the old prophet and he prophesies, thus says the Lord, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, a lion will kill you on the way home. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. The boy ran from the table and he went on the road and a lion killed him. But the lion didn't eat him. He stood by the body. And the old prophet gets up and he goes on the road. And there is the dead body of the boy. And there is the lion next to the boy. And the prophet knew it was his fault. And the prophet knew he gave a wrong word. I don't know what God did to punish the old man. But that wasn't the will of God for that boy. Do you remember when Paul said he's going to go to Rome to testify to Caesar? Paul knew his, his, his path. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was willing to die in order to witness to the ruler of the whole world. That was Caesar. So Paul went in the will of God. When he gets to Jerusalem, a godly man with a good heart and the right spirit, he stands up and he prophesies. And this is what he says. He took his belt off. He tied his hands and he said, Paul, Paul, the Holy Spirit says, if you go to Rome, you will be a prisoner like this. If we judge just by the words, then people would tell Paul, don't go, don't go. God is saying not to go. But Paul said, yes, that's exactly what I'm prepared to do. In other words, it was a confirmation from God that imprisonment is waiting for you. But Paul knew that and Paul is ready to do that. You see how one prophecy could be interpreted two ways? And it was a good prophecy. So I believe that if God wants to guide your life, one more thing, and you know, forgive me if you disagree with me. How many kids... 
would go to the prophet to ask who they should marry. That is so wrong. <laughs> A prophet's going to tell you who you're supposed to marry? Why don't you just ask God who you're supposed to marry? Amen? <laughs> and if the prophet confirms it, well, praise God for that. <laughs> Number eight. God sometimes will give you a revelation. We don't have time to talk about that. But Moses asked for the next step. He said, I heard your voice, but I want to see your glory. And then God put him in the cleft of the rock, covered him with his hand. And then as his glory passed by, the face of Moses was shining with the after effects of the glory of God. And people saw that. Number nine is the most common way that God will speak to you and to me today. Number nine is a still, quiet voice in your spirit. It seems like your thoughts, but it's not your thoughts. I've heard the voice of God many, many, many times, and I knew it was God. Because your spirit will feel the peace of God. And then if you're not sure, ask for two and three confirmations. Do you know in 1 Kings chapter 19, a tremendous man of God, a prophet called Elijah, he was greatly used of God by his prayer. No rain came for three and a half years. By his prayer, God sent rain. And then in chapter 18, and yes, chapter 18, there were 850 false prophets of Baal and another god. And Jezebel was the key queen with Ahab. They were very wicked. And they were leading the people of Israel into idol worship. And the prophet had enough. And he said, let us call all the prophets of Baal and let's see whose God will answer by fire. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but they called their prophets and they cried to their prophets and there was no answer. And Elijah put water on his altar and fire came from heaven, whether it was lightning or just supernatural fire, we're not told. And the fire was consumed, excuse me, the Bulls were consumed, the wood was consumed, even the stones were consumed, and all the water in the trench they dug around the altar was consumed. And then he killed 850 prophets by the river, and the queen said, you will die by tomorrow. God strike me dead if that doesn't happen. Elijah had spent so much emotional energy that at the end he was clinically depressed he got so depleted so used up I want to die I'm the last one and he started to feel sorry for himself I'm the only one and God says all right go to the mount of God and so Elijah went a long distance and you know what the angel did the angel brought him food and water and Elijah ate and drank and went to sleep. And then he went a longer distance and he comes to a cave. Now here's what happened in 1 Kings 19. Sometimes we think that God is in the fire. God is in the noise. God is in the earthquake. God is in the wind. God is in the lightning. So three things happened. The mountain shook, but God was not in the earthquake. Then fire came, but God was not in the fire. And a wind came that was bursting the rocks, and God was not in the wind. And then God came, and the Bible says that Elijah went to the mouth of the cave, and he heard the still, quiet voice of the Lord. Elijah, why have you come? Oh, God, I'm the last one. No one is left. And God corrects him. No, 7,000 men have not bowed. But you asked to come with me. 
I will come and take you. Anoint Elisha. And so that little inner voice is the best way to hear the voice of God. Now, number 10 is the Bible. And we're going to come to an end of our, our, our teaching. Do you know that the Bible will speak to you more than any other way, including the voice of God? When you read the word, when you hear the word, when you study the word, when you meditate on the word. But I have a question for you. Is opening up the Bible at, by chance the way that God can speak? Yes, but don't do it too often. <laughs> Because you can't make God speak by just opening the Bible. One guy tried to do that. He said, God, speak to me. And he pointed to a verse. And it said, and Judas hung himself. <laughs> no, I can't be the will of God. <laughs> he said, God, no, no, no. He said, this time, speak to me. Opens it to a different place. Go and do likewise. <laughs> no, that's not God's will. <laughs> However... When I was to marry my wife, Esty, her older sister, <laughs> she asked a funny question. How come you're marrying the middle sister? Meaning what? <laughs> I have to go down the line first? <laughs> she said, you have a verse from God. You always have a verse from God. And you know what I said? I don't have a verse from God, but I have peace from God. But you know that kind of irritated me? Kind of bothered me that she challenged me that way? And that night, after I got her parents' blessing, after we made plans for the wedding, I said, God, if you want to, you can speak to me through opening the word of God. But if not, it's okay, Lord. And you know, I opened up the Bible and it went to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 9. And you know Ecclesiastes 9 verse 9 says? Next slide. Nope, you leave it right there. I'll quote it for you. Live happily with the wife that God gives you. For the wife that God gives you will be your best reward under all of your earthly toil under the sun. Yes. The next morning I went to her older sister. I said, look at this verse. Put your nose right here. Read this passage. That's what I said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Now, let me give you the final warnings. Warning. Number one, don't demand that God would speak. He will speak when it's necessary. And secondly, when you or I fulfill his conditions. Number two, next slide. Be careful when you say, God told me. Better to say, I believe or I have an impression or this is on my heart. I'll tell you a funny story. One time... A church, I'm not going to say where, right? They were looking to buy a new building. So they got together with the Bratsky Soviet, the church board. And one of the brothers, he heard of a school that's going to be um, up for sale. Brothers, I believe this is from God. God put it on my heart. God told me that building is ours. So they're ready to make an offer on Wednesday. And by Saturday, the people selling the building changed their mind and they said, we're not going to sell the school. So next week, when the brothers got together again, they said, well, brother, you said God told you that the building is ours. Now what? And you know what the brother said? Bratia, ja sam ne dumao, še tak Bog mene kida ne. Brethren, I never expected that the Lord would leave me in the lurch like that. No, the Lord didn't kidanetebe. The Lord did not leave you. You spoke in behalf of the Lord when he didn't say anything. Be careful of that. Number three, always confirm your word. Ask God for two or three confirmations. Number four is powerful. Die to your own desire. When your heart is truly surrendered, you will seek his will. That's what Jesus, Jesus said to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. Do you know God sees the heart? And when he sees your heart is truly given over to the will of God, 
you know what? You will hear the voice of God. And finally, number five, to hear the voice of God is not to be proud. Oh, I, God speaks to me. I hear the voice of God regularly. No, God will stop talking to you. Don't seek your glory. God wants to speak to every Christian. Why are you special that you think that God only speaks to you? That's wrong. That's a wrong heart attitude, and that's pride. And you know what the Bible says? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. Would you stand with me tonight? Could someone come to the keyboards? I want to pray with you tonight. I want us to take a few minutes to, to be in the presence of God. I'm going to pray, pray a prayer first. And then our brother will choose a chorus that we're all going to sing. And don't rush to go anywhere. Put yourself in the place where tonight you will say to the Holy Spirit, God, I, I've been stubborn. You've been speaking to me, but I, I've been afraid to listen. Or say to God, God, I haven't heard your voice. Is it because I'm not listening? Is it because there's sin in my heart? Am I being stubborn? I don't know what is keeping you from hearing the voice of God. But I want to tell you tonight that God wants to talk to you. God desires to talk to you more than you desire to talk to God. And the next time you pray, whether tonight or another day, don't just rush and tell God like a shopping list. At the end of your prayer, say, God, is there something you want to say to me? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening and you know if you have a heart that wants to hear God when God is ready when you're ready when I'm ready God will tell us as well you know the Bible says trust in the Lord with all your heart don't lean on your own understanding in all your ways put him first and he will direct you. And you will hear a voice behind you, says the prophet Isaiah. This is the way. Walk in it. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. God will guide you in ways you will marvel. God will protect you. God will lead you. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me to green grass. He puts a table in front of me, even when there's enemies all around. My cup runs over. Your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. What? Some days? All the days of my life. And when our time is finished on this earth, we will live in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Let's pray together, shall we? Jesus, we love you tonight. We thank you that we are your sheep. You are our shepherd, Lord. Lead us to the water that's quiet. Lead us to the green grass for our soul. Lead us to the words of God that bring comfort. Lord, let our cup overflow. Let the anointing of your Holy Spirit come on our life. And let it overflow to bless others, Lord. It's not enough that we heard your voice one time or two or more. Continue to speak to hearts, Lord. Continue, Lord, to speak to the house of God. Lead our leaders, Lord. Lead the husbands with their wives and their children. Lead the men. Lead the women. Lead the children. 
help us to know your will lord we believe you want to speak to us lord we believe you want to guide us lord we believe lord but father help us lord jesus lead us in a chorus and we'll continue to pray and to continue to worship you're all i need lord help me know you are Worship the Lord, worship the Lord. You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are need. Talk to God. You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are need. Worship, worship, worship. You're all. Praise Him tonight. Call out to God. Talk to Jesus. Talk to the Lord tonight. You're all I want. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit of the living God, move in our lives, move in our hearts, Lord. Speak to us, Jesus. Let us know your ways, Lord. You're all I want. Help me know you are But if we take this time just to be quiet before the Lord, how about if with this time we just be silent? Dear God, we give you this opportunity. Father, we spoke about hearing your voice. Now, Lord, give a living demonstration to those who need it to those that you want to speak to, Lord. And if you have something to say to me, to anyone here tonight, we're here now, Lord. We quiet our hearts. We give to you our will and our desire. Forgive us any sins. Wash us in the blood. By faith, we know that you will speak if you have something to tell us. And we pray you bind the enemy. Where it is written, greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. And it is written, submit yourselves to God and resist the devil. We bind the enemy in Jesus' name. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening, Lord. Just a few moments, let's be quiet.